Here we go. The seminar is about to begin. So let me open with the first question. Um, how would you describe the theoretical puzzle or problem that you were addressing in your chapter? I would like to begin with Fiona taking this one on. Would you like to tell us about your theoretical problem, please? I would. Greetings. Thanks so much, Lisa. And thanks to everybody um, who's here today. So the puzzle that my co-author, Amy Whitaker, and I explored in our paper is the relationship between money and meaning in an art scandal. And in cultural sociological terms, we can think in terms of purity and impurity. So we know from a rich body of work in sociology that art scandal, that is to say, ruptures to the social order over the status or acceptability of an artwork often hinges on interpretations of the symbols and forms that come into those artworks. And within this outstanding body of work, we could look at just two examples, Nicola Beisel's 1993 AJS article on a scandal at the Knoedler Art Gallery in early 20th century New York over Victorian nudes. And that brought censorship into play. Um, a more recent publication that exemplifies this tradition is Arya Dutt's 2008 book on scandal, where he unpacks the Oscar Wilde trial and what led to Wilde's downfall and the strategic position taking that erupts around the moral status of um, Wilde as the artist and by extension his artwork. A separate wing of sociological work has examined the role of money in the status of artworks, and we're probably all familiar with some of the frameworks that have come into play here, including disinterestedness or the scripts and choreography that go into um, sort of partitioning the work of art from the dirty work of monetization. And yet Amy and I thought there's a way to link these two such that money and meaning, purity and impurity are working on a gradation rather than through a series of strict binary codes. So we settled on um, a scandal involving a dealer called Inigo Philbrick, um, who was later found guilty of um, some financial crimes, wire fraud, and really the vehicle that he used to um, develop his art trades was a form of financialization that involved divvying up an artwork and selling it in shares to different investors. So the kind of skip to the end part here is that Philbrick's primary transgression as we examine it is that he oversold shares in the artworks such that buyers were effectively buying nothing. And this we see as a key um, component in the art market scandal because the only relational tie that art market insiders can actually rely on is that they're buying something real, a real creative work. Art market values um, are notoriously difficult to predict. Um, the rise and fall of a trendy artist could be long, it could be short, but what investors have traditionally relied on is the knowledge that at least the one thing they're buying is a real thing. So this financialization scheme dissolved that and this leads us to the financial simulacrum or the idea building on Baudrillard that the um, financialized artwork is in itself a copy that has no real origin. So I'd be happy to say more about that later, but that's just to um, kick things off, Lisa, in terms of the puzzle that we were examining together. Fantastic. Um, I would like to continue with chapters that are about art and move now to Laura. Could you tell us about your theoretical problem? Absolutely, I can. Thanks, Lisa. It's great to, uh, to share the floor with my fellow contributors to the volume. So in answer to your question, in my chapter, I was interested in how meaning is made on the ground in the gallery space. And I was specifically looking at um, contemporary visual art galleries, which are my regular haunt. It was apparent to me from my own experience, but also from an ethnography that I was conducting of an art gallery, 
that these galleries were clearly not standalone, reified, unimpeachable places, but rather that they were places that people encountered um, in, as part of their everyday life. Um, and that the meanings that they were trying to uphold were therefore in this constant dynamic tension with neighboring zones of meaning and neighboring zones of practice. So I became interested really in this dynamic tension between galleries and their neighboring spaces. And so that's what I was trying to puzzle out in this chapter. Now, of course, I wasn't coming to this fresh. Um, meaning making in the gallery, in the contemporary visual art gallery, as it tends to appear as a white cube, has been studied time and again from many, many different disciplinary angles. Um, but within sociology, a lot of this work has looked at people's interactions in the gallery space. And my article took its title Beyond Interaction from this. This work tends to foreground people's conversations or their gestures, even the movement of their eyes and how that leads to the interpretation of artworks. People often talk about the clues that are shared between gallery going groups. In art theory, we've seen um, this topic addressed most clearly in Brian O'Doherty's hugely influential work, Inside the White Cube, the ideology of the gallery space. And that book discusses the modernist principle of the White Cube and how that serves to manufacture this apparently contextless, contextless space where the art object can reign supreme and in which power relations over display and meaning become hidden. So the problem as I saw it, or the puzzle as I saw it, was that these approaches tend to iron out the, the site specificity of the gallery. They tend to use the word the gallery as a general word rather than talking about a specific space in time. And they have little space for meanings other than the interpretation of individual artworks. So that seemed to me to be rather an oversight. It seemed hugely consequential that the gallery I was studying was based in an urban context, in a very particular retail zone, in a very old and very storied building, and in a city, Liverpool, about which many stories have been told and will be told. It is, it's a curatorial commonplace to take these kind of things for granted, so I didn't see it as beyond the sociology, a meaningful sociology of artworks to do the same. So the puzzle was how to reintegrate the gallery with its local context in the study of meaning making. And I wanted to wrap into my analysis things like the architecture of the gallery or design languages or urban history, as all of those things do meaningful heavy lifting in particular gallery spaces. So suffice for now to say that that led me to organize my research around the windows of the gallery that I was studying, which gave out onto the busy street outside. The windows acted to make the gallery space porous and to show how these meaningful contexts came into contact with one another. So the windows really manifested how zones of meaning can intermingle and how artworks can become meaningful or lose their meaning as part of everyday life. And I'll leave it there for now. Okay, let's move on to music now. Alex, could you tell us about your chapter, please? Sure. So uh, so the theoretical puzzle that my chapter is grappling with is um, really a kind of deeper understanding of the ways in which cultural producers and other uh, intermediaries in cultural fields uh, contribute to um, defining and constituting what legitimacy means in that particular field at any given point in time. Um, so my chapter comes directly from my dissertation project, which was concerned with uh, examining the creative practices and professional lives of contemporary American composers. Um, and early in the process of developing this project, it was very clear to me that I wanted to speak directly to calls from cultural sociologists and sociologists of art and music uh, with regard to the ways in which understanding processes of meaning making are crucial in our understanding of how um, an art form like classical music uh, maintains its legitimacy, uh, particularly in the US in the 21st century. Um, given that there's such a wide range of uh, media that we are constantly being exposed to. And so um, in this chapter, I argue that um, composers, through their individual creative practices, their professional uh, interactions with other composers and other uh, classical music intermediaries, as well as their uh, advocacy work with classical music organizations, um, they construct difference and diversity as kind of the organizing principles for a social aesthetics of contemporary classical music. 
Uh, and I use that term, or I borrow that term, uh, social aesthetics from uh, Georgina Bourne. There are a couple of other uh, sociologists who use that as well, but Georgina Bourne, who is uh, an anthropologist and musicologist, um, has been developing social aesthetics as a kind of theory of music's mediation for probably, gosh, going on two decades now. Um, and so the argument that she makes is, in addition to what we get from um, scholars such as Pierre Bourdieu and Paul DiMaggio, which is a focus on um, sort of the, uh, the institutional role that is played in sort of constructing boundaries between certain classes, how classical music functions as one example of um, ways in which we construct boundaries between different um, class groups. We should also understand how the ways uh, in which individuals go about the creative process uh, and the ways in which they interact uh, professionally with others plays a very crucial role in sort of structuring the nature of uh, legitimacy in a particular field. And so I spent several years between 2017 and 2021 uh, collecting data in the form of interviews with composers and music critics and other music intermediaries, as well as uh, doing participant observation um, at various composer-related and classical music-related events. Um, and it's that participant observation data that I draw from primarily for the article. Um, and the idea is that difference and diversity represent a range of ideas, beliefs, and actions that composers and other intermediaries engage in, um, whether it be a composer seeking to um, find ways to incorporate um, popular and vernacular musical styles into classical music forms, or um, uh, individual composers or music organizations incorporating diversity, equity, and inclusion discourse into their mission statements, uh, or their attempts at building at and maintaining audiences. Uh, and so in that sense, difference in diversity as concepts function on the instrumental level, no pun intended, uh, insofar as they uh, help to sort of organize the ways in which composers go about producing their work and organizations go about developing programs um, that promote those ideas. But they also function on the symbolic level as um, sort of ways of grounding legitimacy for 21st century American music. So no longer are we so focused on classical music's ability to provide a sort of disinterested uh, intellectual aesthetic experience, but rather the belief is that the music really should, um, in, in as much as it reflects the lived experience of the composer, should also relate to the listener in, in a very similar way. Thank you. Um, it appears that Dominic is having trouble logging in. So I would like to stay with you, um, Alex, if I could, and um, ask you to, to start uh, responding to the second question, which is about how you conceptualized meaning in your chapter. This, as I mentioned at the beginning, was very much the purpose of the volume, to, to, to really develop a meaningful sociology of the arts and, and figure out what this means. So how exactly did you go about this? Um, using the, the theoretical uh, tools that you assembled. Yeah, so doing this type of project, it would be very sort of tempting to, um, to reach for scholars like Adorno, who, um, you know, had a lot to say about music's meaning, uh, but really sort of saw it uh, as, a, for him, it was a process of looking specifically at the music and being able to say something about sort of the broader um, structure of the economy and sort of the social world, um, how music is able to reflect that. Um, he didn't have a lot of very nice things to say about most of the music that existed at the time that he was writing. Um, but what I wanted for this project was to be able to understand meaning in a way that is not necessarily specific to the music, but is really about the ways in which uh, cultural producers, composers in particular, go about um, processes of creating their music, in uh, as much as they go about processes of constructing a kind of um, public facing uh, artistic identity. Um, and so there were, and this really sort of came out for me in the process of analyzing the data um, with the participant observation data in particular. There were kind of two things that I, I focused uh, a significant amount on. And that was, um, first of all, looking at the way in which composers and other intermediaries talk about their beliefs and their worldviews and the ways in which they connect those beliefs to um, the ways in which they go about creating their music. And so just a couple of quick examples would be uh, a composer who's very, uh, who has very strong feelings about environmentalism or, or climate change um, will specifically develop projects, um, uh, musical projects that um, seek to explore those ideas. Um, but even looking more granularly, um, I thought about specific language and the ways in which composers and other uh, art music intermediaries use language 
One example specifically from the chapter would be um, the American Composers Forum, um, uh, specifically challenging the use of the word classical to refer to the type of music that uh, that these composers are producing. Um, it, for anyone who read the chapter, I, I um, tend to use the phrases like art music uh, as opposed to classical music, simply because uh, many of the composers that I interacted with um, really were uh, very against the use of that term. Um, and so for me, exploring this concept of meaning is really about making sense of through looking at the way that composers and other musicians talk about the value um, and the purpose of their music, what music should do and what it uh, what it's designed to do, how it's designed to reach a diversity of different audiences um, becomes a very important theme uh, in understanding how difference and diversity function as these sort of guiding principles. Um, and I think it's done, at least I'd like to think in this article, it's done in a way that um, I haven't really seen, at least with regard to uh, uh, classical music in particular. I think there's been a, a fair amount of work, particularly in the in the space of visual art, that has been able to do that. And so hopefully I've been able to make a significant contribution in that way. Well, I, I think you have. Um... Laura, could we turn to you to talk about finding meaning in the art gallery? Yes, absolutely. And I appreciated being asked uh, to think again about this question. It's something that I do address in the uh, text of my art school, but it was nice to be asked to think about it again with that bit of distance from having written about it. And I realized that so much of my thinking about art um, and uh, uh, leading me into this, this chapter has been informed by uh, Susan Sontag's ever inspiring essay called um, Against Interpretation, which um, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with. I only gave Sontag a passing reference in this chapter, but really when I was thinking about this question, she did seem to sit at the core of it. So just a quote from the essay that she writes, interpretation is the revenge of the intellect upon the world. To interpret is to impoverish, to de deplete the world, in order to set up a shadow world of meanings. Now, I wish I could write as floridly and as beautiful as Sontag, but, um, and it might seem a little perverse to use that particular quote in a discussion of meaning-centered sociology, but hear me out. So what I think Sontag is really saying here is that meaning is often understood in her context as the cognitive content of, art, of artworks, as A means B or C means D. And that is, of course, because she was writing into the highly intellectualized American art world of her time with conceptual art and, and such like. But I do think that the tendency is visible in a lot of sociological studies of the gallery space. This is the diagnosis um, that I found when I was generating my article. Many of these studies do prioritize the interpretive strategies that people undertake in the gallery. So that might be knowledge sharing between groups or looking at how gallery goers engage with interpretation panels. So basically the assumption is that meaning in the gallery means discursively interpreting individual artworks that are already set out and um, separated from one another in the space. But as I was following um, the artworks being installed in the gallery and watching them in the everyday life of the gallery, it became clear that this process of differentiation between what is art and what isn't is actually an ongoing and continual thing. And that meaning is more diverse than this content-led um, idea. So I wanted to draw on more expansive models of meaning, such as those that call on notions of atmosphere or the iconic term that recognize non-discursively rendered meanings that circulate in the gallery. So Sontag argues that we should pay attention to form instead of content, and I think that's mirrored in calls within Iconic Turn or similar to take seriously the sort of sensuousness of our experiences. Of course, that makes it a more difficult thing to study, and it raises the age-old questions of art experience, what it is, how it's socially constructed, etc. But without settling those debates, we can still embrace a more expanded idea of meaning in the gallery that takes seriously artworks as enigmatic, as seductive, or sometimes as completely nothing to us. Um, and that they're bound up with everyday life worlds, with times and with particular places. And I think that's really important. So I'll finish with another quote from Sontag. She writes, the aim of all commentary on art now should be to make works of art more 
rather than less real to us. Fiona, you have the unenviable task of following Sontag. So uh, please. It's more than following. Laura. It's more than in following Laura and Alex that frightens me, Lisa. Um, I have to say the art market is saturated with meaning. And when Amy and I started this project, we took seriously all forms of meaning. Sometimes that means the desires the passions that could be expressed verbally um, in an art market report or in an interview. Sometimes it's more the knowingness, um, the um, affected disposition of somebody with art historical understanding or information. Sometimes it's hermeneutical. Sometimes those meanings come into play in people's interpretations and some of those um, transcend words. Right. So we're talking about a range of different ways of responding to artworks. And what's critical here and what's deeply sociological is that markets are made by people. They are populated by people um, and the transactions are social ties. So with all of that in mind, Amy and I decided early in our research that in order to understand the art market scandal in the Inigo Philbrick case, we needed to take all forms of meaning um, as serious meaning and try to understand the structure in which they operate and how they jostle with each other. So we say in the article that um, theoretically we try to traverse the dialectical tension between purity and impurity. Um, and here we owe a great deal of credit to sociologists who have come before us, including Erica Kosler, who um, has demonstrated how different meanings of um, artwork come into play constantly through money and through symbolic form. We decided to really center the role of the dealer in projecting interpretive authority that can contain and validate any range of meanings. So the role of the dealer is really crucial. The dealer's um, trying not to police meanings like a critic might, but instead project an authority of confidence that can uphold, legitimate, and value any interpretation or response to an artwork. Like the dealer has sp some specific um, interest in doing so. He wasn't telling his potential buyers what to think about an artwork, although he certainly had the knowledge and education capable of doing that. Instead, he was performing a confidence that was there to support a wide range of interpretations. So that's the way in which we um, theoretically approached meaning. Um, how do these capacious structures of meaning come into play and what work do they do? And I'd be happy to say more about the methods that we used to investigate that. Well, by an enormous coincidence, the next question is indeed about methods. So um, we are um, going to talk now about how we investigate meaning empirically um, and the methodological challenges of grappling with this concept and um, making theoretical commitments have um, meaningful uh, methodological uh, extensions. So, uh, Laura, could I ask you to um, begin addressing this one, please? Absolutely. Thank you, Lisa. So the way that I, as I described, how I theoretically set up my research, particularly on the focus on, um, the focus on atmospheres of gallery spaces and their neighboring zones of meaning, rather than on discursive meaning or interpretive strategies, made it a bit of a challenge methodologically. I had to depart from some of the more traditional um, sociological studies of the gallery space. So on the one hand, thick description and the ethnographic method appeared a natural fit for the empirical study of, of this phenomenon. And that was actually the main method that I drew from in this chapter. However, 
you will notice um, that my chapter also features photographs, which are actually film stills. And these are testament to the fact that I was also using visual methods in my study. So I was making a film of the process of installing and de-installing um, an exhibition of contemporary art. Now that film ended up being short, it was 15 minutes, it was two channel, and it's designed and has been installed um, on two separate screens, one slightly in advance of the other. Um, in the, the sort of visual grammar that I was drawing on was itself informed by artists who work in moving image. Now, visual methods seemed to me an apparently um, good choice for the particular study that I was taking. Uh, this was because it, well, um, perhaps because it was my first substantive work of sociology and my background was in art theory. So I was somewhat more comfortable with the idea of visual methods, also galleries photograph really well. However, I did begin to realize that there was something more sophisticated about the relationship between visual methods and the kind of meanings that I wanted to study. So what I really wanted to tune into through these visual methods was this atmosphere of the gallery space. And atmospheres are by now theoretically very well developed and debates about methods of researching atmospheres are quite lively. But in another field, in film studies, atmosphere is also a very current topic of discussion. Particularly, horror movies are often described as atmospheric and that has led a lot of film, well, um, uh, film theorists to talk about atmosphere as being consequential in the genre of horror. So what I was trying to do, or at least how I now describe what I was trying to do, was to use the atmospheric potential of the moving image and the camera to engage with this atmosphere of the gallery. But I must say, I did stop short of making a horror movie of the art gallery, but maybe that's the direction for future study. In your hands, I think it would be fascinating. Um, Fiona, back to you. Could you tell us about all the different data sources you were working with for this chapter with Amy? There were many of them. I think I'll focus on one, uh, Lisa, for my remarks. We understood fairly early on in our study that if we really wanted to understand what happens in an art market scandal, we had to study the parties. So there's a strong tradition in sociology of studying the para-institutional spaces that shape artworks and creativity. Um, thinking here of Howard Becker and Hannah Wall. Um, thinking here also of um, Olaf Veltus and like the backroom spaces in the gallery, Gary Allen Fine's work on the um, small communities as the basis for meaning making and cohesiveness. Parties, however, um, that I wasn't invited to uh, had to be studied because we needed to know the forms of discourse, capital, and social tie relatedness that went into structuring um, the meaning making around the work and its um, financial deals. So to do this, Amy and I interviewed Art World Insiders. This um, included a range of people who preferred to speak on background, but they were at some of these exclusive parties. Um, they witnessed Inigo Philbrick in the room. And if any of you are on Google right now, you can just enter his name, search for images, and most of what you'll find, I think, will be um, Inigo looking um, slim, well-dressed, tailored suit, and just appropriately crumpled as though he doesn't care too much, enough to project confidence in any room, but a guy who knows how to have a good time. And so one of the art market insiders that we spoke to was Kenny Schachter, and Kenny Schachter is a big wheel in this space. Um, he described himself as uh, Inigo's wingman, um, both in terms of drinking prodigious amounts of um, monkey gin and wine, and in how they knew art and introduced each other, right? Like this was a real way of doing business, not accessible to everybody. And Kenny Schachter provided us with the line that still stands out, perhaps in the entirety of my academic career, um, that Philbrick was capable of, um, of strolling into a gallery with balls of steel. 
And with that in mind, I think we have the encapsulation of a method. What we're talking about is the bodily capital, the projection of self. Um, yes, the accent is there, the education pedigree, very important, and ego had that all. But what we he really understood um, through work, through study and through practice was how to work a room and map out the social relations that were going to be um, most helpful. So interviews were helpful, um, so were media stories. Uh, we read a wide range of um, you know, newspaper types, social media, Instagram accounts. We wanted the full package. So you have to imagine yourself at an exclusive party. It's London and it's 2 a.m. And this guy comes over to you with some chat and perhaps offers a glass of champagne and has a phone photo of a beautiful piece of art that he wants you to look at. This is the kind of chat that leads to multi-million dollar investments. So we have in our mind's eye, I think, as sociologists of art, this image of the formal institutions, whether it's a bricks and mortar auction house, the white cube gallery, the museums that Laura has studied um, so brilliantly, but at the same time, there are these para-institutional spaces that really matter, that really are at the heart of structuring um, and determining the value and the worth of artworks. So that is the space that we try to probe. Um, and it's why we use such a diverse range of sources in the article. Thank you, Fiona. Alex, can you tell us if you also needed to be finding your way into the party scene of uh, uh, classical composers? Uh, I'm sure we can all imagine what those are like. Um, or were there other methods that you used to investigate meaning? Yeah, so um, I mentioned earlier uh, that I draw from Georgina Bourne's concept of social aesthetics. And what's so fascinating about uh, the development of that theory is that she um, focuses on kind of a, four different planes of social uh, music's ability to uh, mediate social situations. The first being the idea that music um, sort of it, it sort of facilitates its own social relations, whether it be in performance, rehearsal, what have you. Um, second being the fact that it has the ability to facilitate uh, the development of community among um, like-minded individuals. Um, based on kind of the way in which they value certain types of music and the way in which it's performed. Uh, third, the idea that um, one's social position um, and its reflection in their work, particularly from the perspective of composers, uh, be it race, gender, class, what have you, um, also uh, is very sort of active and expressing meaning and expressing particular ideas about what music is capable of achieving. Uh, and fourth, the idea that um, music emerges from uh, institutions that um, have a very specific role in mediating uh, both its its interpretation um, and the ways in which it's produced and distributed. And so with um, that type of a framework to work from, um, like I said, I, I conducted interviews and I, I engaged in participant observation. The participant observation data in particular, which in some cases did include uh, going to parties, um, going to kind of like after concert gatherings that uh, included composers kind of um, uh, shooting the breeze with musicians and other uh, uh, other music intermediaries. Uh, and so being a fly on the wall of those situations was very crucial. Um, but most much of the data spe specifically that I talk about in the chapter comes from more formal settings uh, in which I might attend say uh, a weekend composer workshop where uh, composers, uh, often student composers are presenting their work to uh, more experienced uh, professionals in the field uh, in the form of a master class or something to that effect. Um, and so a lot of the data that I was able to collect in these situations was um, in a sense, uh, being able to hear discussions about the formal properties of music, the things that we might normally expect um, in these situations but in reality, um, a lot of the discussions tended to be, once we got past the formal properties, the, the discussions tended to focus much more on, okay, so what kind of value do you intend for this particular piece to have? Um, and so given the different settings that I was able to, um, to sort of be in and, and observe uh, at different points in time, it was interesting to sort of see kind of the range uh, of ways that composers talk about their work in both formal and informal settings. 
Um, and a lot of what I was able to sort of get from um, the, the, the variety of settings was an understanding of the ways in which the music often reflects how individuals wish to see themselves um, and the ways in which they um, wish to see their lived experiences and their identities reflected um, in an environment, in, a, in an art world that traditionally um, has excluded or marginalized many different types of people. Um, and so a lot of the discourse really centers around pushing back against these traditional stereotypical ideas about what the classical uh, composer is, uh, sort of dispelling the myth of the composer genius, for example, but also thinking about uh, classical music or art music's capacity, um, uh, but still sort of wanting to maintain some sense of distinction um, insofar as that's really possible from popular music forms that uh, in a lot of ways are still seen as kind of a lesser art form. Um, despite the push to incorporate more of those musical styles into uh, the production of classical music. And so being able to be up close and personal in those workshop settings, uh, in those informal kind of after parties, after people have had a couple of drinks and they're speaking more freely, um, there, there is often a lot of consistency in terms of being critical of sort of the, the general, uh, the way in which a lot of composers think that classical music is perceived versus this push towards um, wanting to implement and incorporate uh, much more diversity into the field. But as I point out towards the end of the chapter, um, even the way in which diversity and uh, difference are incorporated are mediated in such a way that uh, often classical music organizations want to maintain a kind of neutrality that composers as the artists wanting to express a very specific idea um, often want to push past. And so that often um, sort of creates conflict um, and sort of being able to witness that in these um, formal and informal spaces uh, was uh, it provided much uh, in the way of rich data that um, I was only able to really talk about a, a small portion of it in the chapter. Thank you, Alex. Now I'm delighted that um, Dominic Zelinsky is uh, has sorted out the technical problems and has joined us. So. Uh, Dominic, uh, I need you to catch us up a little bit about your chapter. You didn't have the luxury of being able to talk to the people um, because it was a historical topic. So can you tell us a little bit about the theoretical puzzle that's at the, the heart of, of your contribution to the edited volume and some of the methodological challenges that you faced in, um, in trying to analyze and investigate meaning in this setting? Yeah, uh, well, first of all, thank you very much, uh, Lisa and Laura, for inviting me. Thanks, everybody, for um, for coming in. I'm very sorry um, for uh, um, the, the problem, um, but I'm here now. So thanks again. Thanks again. So um, uh, the, 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 the genesis of the paper um, was, I would say, more actually of an empirical puzzle, or it began more of an empirical puzzle, and it was very long in gestation um, because I started writing it as my BA thesis um, 10 years ago. Uh, and it was thanks to, to the opportunity to contribute to this volume that I eventually um, finished it up into a kind of a proper research paper. Um, and the topic that, or, or, or the place where I began was um, really uh, um, the, the place of jazz music um, in Eastern Europe um, during the early Cold War, Cold War era, which originally seemed to me as a very cool episode to research and a very interesting one, um, because the, the narrative kind of went like, um, it is 1940s, communist movement, movements are prevailing in Eastern Europe, and they're at attacking everything that was kind of American, including jazz which was, of course, a major American cultural export at that point in time. Um, but once I really started looking into the, into the thing, um, a lot of puzzling facts did emerge pretty, um, pretty soon. Um, and it became clear that this was not really what had happened. Uh, um, so, so in particular, uh, the puzzle that I found was, uh, why was it so hard? to ban jazz music, uh, because I found out that, that despite Communist Party having you know, so much political clout, in fact, it was at that point an authoritarian or totalitarian, very controlling um, political system. Um, it was in principle unable uh, due to 
to what I found to be its internal kind of meaning making processes um, to position jazz as um, something that could be uh, politically uh, banned. So from from this kind of uh, from the study of this of this of this whole debate that took place through all late 1940s and early 1950s, um, there kind of emerged the 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 image of jazz music as something of a contentious icon or what I called um, following Kurak in, in the paper as impure sacred that was very enigmatic and it was very unclear even to the communists, um, whether whether it should actually be seen as an American um, import, as a kind of an imperialist plan uh, to poison uh, the hearts of the Eastern European working class, uh, or on the other hand, how it actually could be banned if it was a pure artistic expression of uh, the American underclass and uh, the kind of oppressed black population of um, the, the US. And indeed, uh, eventually no ban was, was ever kind of issued. And there was a, a variety of compromises that were sought, such as an attempt to, to, to devise a, a, what was called a people's jazz, where saxophones were substituted for cellos, uh, trumpets were substituted for accordions, and jazz bands were re variously kind of assigned and reassigned. So that was this kind of empirical issue at the heart of the, the problem. Um, and from there um, arose this, this, this bigger question, um, theoretical one, of um, how is meaning um, processually, especially moral meaning in context of art, how it is processually um, constructed, how it is negotiated in various symbolic battles um, and uh, and how it eventually becomes um, becomes um, less and le progressively less and less kind of morally um, ambiguous. Um, so, if that answers at least a part of what you were asking. Absolutely. Um, I just wanted you to, to have the chance to say a little bit more about um, what sorts of materials you put together. Yeah. Um, and, and your archival search, um, mm -hmm. especially since you were um, dealing with criticism at the time. So how do you interpret um, yeah. historical criticism that was written in a time where people weren't always kind of talking straight? Um, if you could uh, speak yeah. to that a little bit, please. So I conducted a study basically as a, as, a, as a very classic kind of discourse study. I worked with um, publicly available newspapers that were coming out at that point of time. Uh, I could uh, get my hands on through archives and through um, publications um, on stuff such as um, uh, concert built-ins also. Um, and in the media, um, the, the, the entire kind of research of this era, the problem that looms over it is the fact that naturally the kind of contrarian voices um, were not always very free to kind of sound loud. Um, but nonetheless, the actual surprising fact to me was that there was a, that there was a decent amount of, of effort um, that could actually kind of penetrate um, the, the, the curtains, so to say, of the communist censorship. Uh, and it, of course, links to what I was, uh, what I was mentioning before, um, to the degree that the, the political class itself and the cultural class itself was very uncertain about what to do with um, jazz music because of its kind of double nature um, as both um, a, a kind of morally pure um, cultural artistic product and at the same time as um, an American cultural import that was seen as, um, as um, a priori uh, problematic to them. So, so this this was really a, a study of a, a relatively wide selection of contemporary newspapers. Um, of course, I mean it was very clear to and very. It was not particularly easy to distinguish the kind of variety of ideological positions that were changing because this is also a very 
um, complex and uncertain era uh, in which ideological positions do switch up very fast. Um, it is not clear what the particular political alliances are, you know, names drop out of the newspapers, chief editors drop out of the newspapers. Um, but, um, I mean, that was a part of the, of the research. Thank you, Dominic. Now, before I open um, the floor to questions from, uh, from our um, audience, I have one last question uh, for the panel. I would like you to speak briefly to how your contribution to this volume, The Cultural Sociology of Art and Music, relates to your other work. Tell us if this is related to how you theorize with art and music in your other research projects. And I'd like to begin with you, Alex, please. Yeah, so um, my approach to developing my chapter is very much related to um, some of my other work. So my first article that came out while I was still in graduate school uh, looks specifically at how composers in the early stages of their careers make sense of, uh, how they make sense of prizes and competitions. Um, and I actually uh, drew quite a bit of uh, inspiration from Lisa's work on um, performance competitions. Um, my approach was to kind of take what was valuable from Lisa's work, uh, as well as uh, other sociologists such as Pierre-Michel Menier, who has a very sort of different, um, almost sort of rational actor approach um, to looking at um, how we explain inequalities uh, and achievement uh, in artistic fields. Uh, and what I found in that research was that composers actually use competitions both as a, a sort of uh, sort of rational instrumental um, way of professionalizing, but they also use it as measures of um, how they're developing their own sense of artistic identity. Um, and so there are uh, there's a, almost kind of a moral principle that's involved in the way that um, competitions and prizes um, are able to sort of shape their sense of self. Um, they have very specific ideas about what ki what kinds of competitions and what times uh, what what types of um, uh, events they want to be involved in, in terms of what will this say about what kind of a composer I am. Um, so I think that speaks very directly to uh, understanding processes of meaning making with regard to artistic identity in particular. Uh, another project, in addition to sort of developing my dissertation uh, into a book project, which is um, taking up most of my time at this point, I'm also uh, developing a, a separate article that is very much concerned with the idea of appropriation and fetishization. Uh, and so given that um, there is much of an emphasis on diversity in the classical music field, there are specific uh, events that are geared towards um, highlighting the work of composers of color, women, uh, and queer composers as well. Um, and so given that there's such a widespread, particularly uh, in the wake of um, George Floyd's death here in the U.S., um, there has been a much more concentrated effort uh, in classical music organizations to um, highlight the work of traditionally marginalized groups of composers. And so um, just based on some of the interactions that I've had with composers um, and some of the observations I, I was able to derive from my field notes, um, I'm wondering if there is a point at which we can determine whether or not um, highlighting certain marginalized groups sort of ventures into a space of fetishization. Um, and I'm seeking to contribute to um, a growing collection of scholarship, particularly musicologists uh, such as Andrea Moore uh, and Mariana Ricci, who um, have taken a very critical approach to what they argue are sort of neoliberal uh, elements that are coming out of the new music world, which focuses on diversity as kind of a driver uh, uh, of a way to reach audiences and doing it in a somewhat cynical way. Um, I don't know the answer to that question yet, whether or not fetishization is something that we can apply um, to uh, to what the, the kind of investigation that I'm doing, but um, what I hope to do with the data that I have is to be able to speak to that question in, uh, in an uh, upcoming article. Well, we look forward to reading that one. Fiona, what about you, theorizing with art and music in your other projects? Thanks, Lisa. I really appreciate the way that you phrased 
this question. You're asking us not have we theorized art and music, but have we theorized with art and music, which to me is so generative. I know so many of us on this um, in this conversation have been trying to understand the social world through art and music um, as companions, as agents, um, maybe as like force fields of meaning and structuring our experiences in the world. So yes, yes, yes. I would say in the broadest possible um, way that across my projects, I've tried to examine the ways in which art becomes an epistemic exception. And what I mean by the epistemic exception is that the usual rules for knowing and doing can be set aside or excused on grounds of the preservation of beauty, um, the experience of passion. Sometimes it's symbolic force and sometimes it's the invocation of humanistic value. So in uh, the book, um, Ruling Culture, which you kindly mentioned earlier, I examine the um, unauthorized excavation of artifacts in Italy and the ways in which tomb robbers who were once celebrated for their knowledge of the country's deep past have become criminalized in a national system that invokes strong authority over the circulation of artworks and antiquities. So the archeological site itself becomes a site of exception in which the state can intervene in ways that it normally wouldn't. But then also there's this vernacular. So there's this um, system of quite formalized vernacular knowledge that is extremely useful for the formal registers of understanding about artifacts, but that derive from these criminalized actors. Uh, just a second um, example, briefly, Lisa, in a 2016 paper that I published, I studied um, an effort to reintroduce color to Greek and Roman marble statues. And this was a case in which conservators and archaeologists used fairly sophisticated methods to reconstruct the actual pigments used on the surface of these sculptures, and they recreated them. Um, this has been a traveling show for several years. The most recent manifestation is in the New York Metropolitan Museum of Art um, as the Chroma Show. What I found was um, strong reactions, um, blowback, folks uh, from all walks of life, um, from museum visitors to high ranking scholars, rejected these repainted sculptures. Um, even though the science was there, they rejected them on grounds that these painted versions didn't match with their ideas or received wisdom about white marble sculpture. So cherished, so lodged in our imaginations about the classical Mediterranean past. So I saw these statues too as an example of the epistemic exception, even though there was strong convincing science and textual evidence and physical um, evidence, um, paintings from antiquity, even though uh, folks needed to keep them white. And I think that that deserves more ongoing attention too for sociologists to think about the ways in which these um, exceptions become the um, platform or the um, vehicle by which other kinds of interests can be um, moved through. So there again, I think we have to have the with and with art theorizing, with art and music to understand how that becomes possible. Thanks. Thank you so much, Fiona. Dominic, over to you. Can you tell us about how your contribution to this volume relates to your other work and how you are theorizing with art and music more generally? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for the question. Um, so for me, really, the sociology part um, and this paper in particular was actually a way into sociology. Um, that's how I started. It was my first um, study that took me eventually 10 years to finish up um, uh, and uh, and publish. Uh, and I do see, I mean, I, I do see, do see um, art in particular um, as, a, as a kind of a, very generative 
um, field um, of, of research for sociology. Um, I didn't really follow up on this particular this particular um, strand, um, though I actually think I I will in some further projects. But what this particular research actually took me into was um, two fields, and one was the empirical field of kind of studying the socialist past of Eastern Europe, of which Lisa is painfully aware because she was the PhD supervisor of my PhD thesis, which I've written about um, unofficial philosophy um, in the 1970s and 80s at the University of Edinburgh. Um, uh, so that was a kind of a direct continuation uh, from my study of jazz um, of the 40s and 50s. And the other field that, that this paper took me into was um, a, a study of, of phenomena of figures and um, objects that are intensely morally ambiguous or morally contested. So major part of the work that I do now is uh, concerned with the theory of um, charisma and redeveloping the classic Weberian um, context uh, concept into a sort of more contemporary uh, applications and um, and issues. So I work with with charismatic figures um, that are not always that, that tend, tend to be deeply kind of polarizing and uh, in a in a very profound way a matter of um, continuous uh, symbolic um, negotiation and renegotiation um, and I did took that from having started with um, this kind of um, un ambiguous uh, phenomenon just, just um, in socialism surprisingly. Well, it looks like you had good intuition from the start for topics. Laura, over to you. Um, could you tell us about how this particular contribution relates uh, to your other research and how you are theorizing with art more generally? And then we'll open the floor for your question. Absolutely, yeah. So writing this chapter has proved really deeply very consequential for the development of my research, chiefly because I have become very obsessed with with windows, which were at the center of the empirical work of the chapter. So I've become uh, very fascinated with windows as physical interventions, physical um, sites through which meaning circulates in the built environment and around which meaning pivots in the built environment and through which identities are played out. I suppose I think of them as a kind of, uh, as a kind of fine line, as the root bell might call it, but I'm also interested in windows and their relation to perspective and the picture plane and the canvas, um, particularly as a form of power in uh, visual culture. So I'm in the very early days of committing myself fully to this being the uh, main chunk of my, my research. I'm currently surrounded by books about windows, which is a pleasure. Um, if any of you are going to the ISA, maybe virtually next week, I am giving a talk called Curating Windows, Creating Cultures. And in that paper, I'm looking at the window as a site of artistic intervention, because I believe there's this new trend for cultural organisations, particularly for galleries, to use their windows as a site of production and as a site of display. While they're typically in the white cube have been worked around, art galleries are now working with their windows and this relates to sort of uh, placemaking and the relationship between art and the city and if you haven't already noticed it I bet you will soon spot a gallery using the window as a site to display artwork outwards. The project however is also going to look at art gallery architecture as my paper did and the role of windows in that but speaking to this question of researching with or through art as Fiona rightly points out you uh, phrased the question around that I'm also interested in windows in artwork. So I'm thinking of running the Greeks and the human condition where you don't know if it's a, uh, if it's a canvas in front of a window or a window as a classic example, but there's films such as Agnes Varda's daguerreotypes. Virginia Woolf uses the window really heavily as a symbol. So the really fun thing about this project is that it does sit between 
sociology, art theory, architecture and art history. This is a space in which I feel very comfortable. And exactly as you say, Lisa, it involves studying with and about art. Well, I look forward to hearing more about how this project develops. So it is now time for us to welcome your questions. If you would like to use the chat, um, Laura is hosting and can see that um, and can uh, tell us uh, and invite you to, to turn on your camera and speak. Uh, but if you would like to raise your hand, that's another way you could indicate to us that you would like to ask a question to either one of the speakers or the panel as a whole. So. Please, you're very welcome uh, to start asking questions or making comments. Okay, I, I think I see one from Barry Gibson, my um, co-convener uh, 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 for the section. Uh, who is asking uh, which sociological theorists we say are uh, we would say are key to our work and why? So um, uh, I'll uh, let um, uh, are you I don't know if that's directed at anyone in particular, so I'm going to uh, give that one to the panel and um, ask if there's a particular theorist who's been most formative for you. Um, Dominic, would you like to go first with that one? Yeah, um, I can, but I can be only um, I can be only very kind of uh, very conventional in saying that uh, I did follow up on uh, on the, the kind of tradition of very classical sociology of Durkheim and uh, Weber, and as I said, like um, I do actually work a lot on charisma um, and this kind of con uh, conceptual um, framework. So I draw a lot actually on uh, the very classical sociology of Weber. But then of course, I mean, it was uh, particularly the strong program to which I came while I was doing this paper originally. Uh, and it, it was a tradition that I did continue throughout my, my, my PhD. And I still draw um, very much on um, that, that framework of uh, the strong program and the cultural pragmatics. So yeah, so it's a big bit of a mixture of a very classical one and more contemporary pieces. Um, did any of the of the other speakers want to uh, chime in on this one? Um, I'll jump in and name check Eduardo de la Fuente who was incredibly important for the development of my paper, particularly his um, text on his idea of textural sociology, uh, where he proposes that the social science should uh, or could consider texture rather than text as the important legacy of the cultural turn. And this uh, allows him to draw attention to things like surfaces and aesthetics um, in a very beautiful way way and that was hugely influential for my thinking of the window as a um as a thing as well i would just love to jump in lisa and say um yes laura and dominic um you've pointed to some really important contributors to my thinking vera zolberg is um a cherished intellectual figure for me um i have to say that early in my graduate um, training, I read um, her work on outsider art, and it blew me away. The ways in which she understands um, vernacular spaces of creative production and marries that with the social structures and forces that kept artists outside. And Vera came to an ASA round table that I was at when I was a baby graduate student. And she listened carefully and she uh, listened to all of us and had astute questions and took notes and um, spoke with me afterwards. And that too made such a deep impression. She was at the height of her professional powers and she did that. So there was somebody who really took the time to think carefully about the ways in which um, art has meaning and people relate to it and why sometimes they're kept out of those spaces. And I really still appreciate just the um, exemplary work that she did and her legendary support for young scholars. So thanks for the question, Barry. 
Yeah, I, I could add to that as well. Um, I would say one of the most important things I learned as a graduate student was um, to think much more in terms of um, how a collection of scholars work, um, how it all works together, and what I can do to build on those ideas uh, and contribute in very particular ways. And so, um, you know, I used to I used to want to say often that, oh, you know, like Bordeaux, I just I just wish I could get past Bordeaux, but I've learned how significant and how important it is to really know and understand Bordeaux so that when I connect Bordeaux to uh, Georgina Bourne, when I connect Bordeaux to Lisa McCormick or to Claudio Benzigri, a lot of uh, more contemporary um, scholars and thinkers whose work has had a very particular influence on my own, I'm very aware, um, not just of the ways in which I'm critical of someone like a Bourdieu or a DiMaggio, but also in the ways in which a lot of the new scholarship is really kind of confirming a lot of the, the things that we find in Bourdieu and, and uh, other scholars of that period uh, in such a way that it informs my ability to speak to a much more synthetic way of developing theory and developing ideas about, um, about what my data are trying to tell me. And so, um, so rather than pointing to a, a couple of different scholars, I mean, I've, I've already mentioned a few, it's really sort of uh, a network of scholars going back to at least Bordeaux and certainly even uh, before that, um, but a network of scholars whose ideas I'm able to take from and adopt and adapt um, to the specificity of my case uh, and, to, um, and to thinking about future projects as well. Thank you, Alex. Okay, Caroline, would you like to um, make a comment or ask a question of the uh, panel or a speaker? Yes, good morning from Los Angeles. And thank you, Dr. McCormick, for organizing this panel. This is great. I actually have a question for Dr. Greenland. Uh, as I'm listening to you, your topic is so interesting. And I wonder if you'd be comfortable talking a little bit about NFTs, if you are. Um, it's still a very confusing area for me to understand, but using your your power and your money frameworks, um, have you thought about how artists or written about how artists um, choose to participate in this NFT space, or maybe even how consumers choose to invest in this space? Thanks for that question, Caroline. Yes. The um, interesting thing about NFTs is that as Amy and I were working on the study, that market was growing. And then, as you know, it peaked uh, in say 2021, 22, and now it's declined again. So my co-author on that study, Amy Whitaker, has written a lot about NFTs. One thing to say is, and I think that this is where um, you're headed, is that social ties and trust become really important. There's also this question about like, what exactly is being purchased in purchasing an NFT? Um, one owner of many, right, of a like share in that piece or the unique code that signifies ownership over that digital um, creation. So for me, this becomes tied up with the space that I was referring to, a space in which social ties matter because trust is the one thing that you can take away from this kind of transaction. I also hear in your question um, a, a concern with like artists, like are artists participating in NFTs? And the interesting news here is that quite a, a few artists, we could say um, up and comers or early career digital artists have created NFTs and made sums of money. So maybe not the kind of um, sum of money that would land them on the front page of a newspaper or Artnet News, but that would be, you know, six figures um, and enough to pay rent for a year and then some and then keep going, then keep building. I'm really interested in that aspect of NFTs because it does signal some um, I could, I think it does signal some promise for more democratization of the arts. And this is where, again, my co-author Amy has been really strong, but the ways in which digital artists are using born digital works to structure their own networks and crucially to devise contracts that allow for the realization of profit through repeat sales. So I know I'm getting a little bit into the weeds here, but um, I remain very intrigued by the directions that um, will be taken here, and I think that artists are asserting themselves in ways not traditionally possible through um, dominant bricks and mortar auction sites. So thanks for the opportunity to expand on that a little bit. 
Okay, our next question comes from Katie Warren. Take it away, Katie. I wondered if there's a potential tension between processes of theorizing with art and music on the one hand and our focus on written outputs in academia. And I know that Laura spoke a bit to this by saying that she'd focused on photography and film stills, which was really great to hear about. But I wondered if others have anything to say about this. I would be happy to venture forth, Katie. Thank you for that question. I struggle with the tension between critique and composition. So my sense, like yours, I believe, is that the primary incentives in academia are given on the basis of text-based publications. And yes, sometimes there's scope for creative formatting, with images, for example, perhaps even links to moving images. For the most part, however, we remain wedded to the um, linguistic register. So the ours is a words dominated field. And yet what we're studying is a range of creative expressions that goes well beyond that, right? And I think when I phrase this as the relationship between critique and composition, that much of what we do is a form of, of social critique, and yet our compositions don't neatly fit in to the frame um, in which we're given tools to work. So all I can say, Katie, is I, I would really welcome others' um, comments on this as well. It's something I think about constantly, and it's also why I have declined to write on certain topics. I just don't feel that the text format in the way that I know it would be able to do justice to the complexity of the work or of the subjects involved in the creation of the composition. And I think like there's a real risk in reducing the complexity of a composition in a text register that then loses some of the essential ingredients, forces, um, forces of like, identity and struggle that are actually integral to its meaning. Thanks. Um, oh, I, can, I can only, if I, if I may follow up, I mean, I can only uh, concur to basically to what uh, Fiona Greenlow was saying. Um, I, I, I do find it also as a major problem, in particular as I kind of, uh, we are in my career into writing about digital spaces. And I mean, I think that we all see kind of the growth of the, uh, what could be, you know, called an ocular culture, that the, a certain move from a purely textual communication into a world that is structured by images um, and pictorial communication. If you want to write about very contemporary things that are also visual, such as such as means, but at the same time, um, I do find that there is a growing space even in the more conventional venues. Um, sociological venues for um, articles that do include considerable um, visual elements. So I think that things are moving kind of in an interesting direction, but I, I'm, I agree that there is um, a, a significant tension. Just to concur, well. I'll let Alex speak. Sorry. Um, I was going to say very quickly, um, so one of the challenges that I experienced, particularly um, in interviewing and interacting with uh, contemporary composers, is that there are times where I have to talk about their music and I have to describe it. Um, and so I want my work to be uh, accessible to folks who may not have much knowledge uh, about the inner workings of this particular world, if for no other reason than to, you know, get some sociological value out of um, what these data are, are presenting. Um, and so the challenge that I face is, how do I describe this music that I'm hearing um, in a textual way that can speak to precisely the kind of, uh, whatever kind of argument I may be trying to make um, and feeling it necessary to, to describe this particular piece of music. Um, and especially if the piece uh, that I'm, I'm talking about has a very uh, particular, um, you know, oral uh, connotation, if it's attempting to do something that, um, in some cases sort of reaches beyond the effect that um, any sort of verbal description of it can provide. 
Um, so one of the ways in which um, music scholars uh, are beginning to combat this, and I see this more uh, in the world of musicology, is to write more um, informally through blogs where you can sort of link um, sound clips uh, from composers and other artists who have provided uh, permission. That uh, tends to work a little bit less and less, maybe we're thinking about online journals for um, for our discipline, but um, but again, to sort of echo what, what folks have already said, that is definitely um, something I spent a lot of time thinking about and um, sort of kind of questioning the value of even talking so specifically about the music, um, given that it's difficult for um, uh, other folks who don't have the access to it that I have to really understand what the purpose is. Just to add, I wholeheartedly um, agree with everything everyone has said, and you know, it's it's what's led me to uh, thinking about visual methods. But what also led me to thinking about visual methods was my experience as an art critic and an art journalist, where I was writing exhibition reviews, which were super dry because they did a lot of that descriptive work that Alex is talking about and they're really difficult to make um, expansive and uh, I think I was falling into the trap of Sontag that I was making works of art less rather than rather than more meaningful but then I think about art well the writing on art that people like Peter Benjamin have done and um, how amazingly expansive that can be about art was well, not being descriptive in any way. It's taking the artwork as a window, for want of a better analogy, into a certain way of seeing the world and a certain way of thinking about the world. So I don't see a hard line between um, writing and the visual in my work. And I was maybe a bit more dogmatic about that as a PhD student than I am now. Thanks everyone. Our next question is from Fatima. Thank you so much. I actually wanted to make more of a comment uh, than a question because uh, these are exactly the problems that I'm having uh, with my work uh, because I'm working on this new theory now. If you, you know, as you discussed, uh, sociology as we have it is, as Fiona has said, very textually oriented. Uh, if you think about it, uh, it, when it was initially formed, when the social sciences were formed in the 18th, 19th centuries, because of Western European modernity, where it privileged knowledge, uh, formal knowledge, observable, visible, measurable, um, you know, and, and, and as a consequence, all those things uh, sort of became encapsulated and bounded as knowledge. I think what was left out was experience, especially experiencing, you know, through aesthetics, uh, uh, value judgments, uh, emotions, and how do we bring those in? Uh, I sort of have this new triangulation theory I'm working on, and I say that, you know, Western European modernity is very much uh, um, using binarisms always uh, between knowledge and power. Uh, and considering knowledge only as sort of what we see uh, literally and observe and measure in the uh, civil sphere or public uh, sphere. So how do you bring in the, the personal, the emotional, the visual and all those things in? I think I say we have to triangulate basically uh, knowledge with experience and power. Uh, when we do that, I think we will be able to bring it all in uh, and study it at least uh, consistently uh, within it, rather than, as we do now, sort of have it marginalized on the side and we're sort of trying to bring it back in. I think it's much more better to work it from the grounds up. So I, that's just what I wanted to share with you. Thank you so much. Muge, that really resonates. Muge Gocek and I have collaborated um, and um, um, co-authored a book on cultural violence. Yeah, Muge, I feel the same. I think an interesting missed opportunity for sociology occurred around aesthetics. I mean, there are many ways in which we could go about this and think about what might have been theoretically for our field. There were phenomenal developments in thinking about aesthetics in the work of Du Bois, if you go back to early volumes of the crisis and read some of the essays there um, on what we might call situated aesthetics, the ways in which people were experiencing music and poetry and literature, 
Um, it was much more in line with a fully um, experienced holistic understanding of aesthetics. I feel that that is a tradition that could have been brought in and still can be, but hasn't been, right? I think also Zimmel had a really interesting then um, has since become kind of an eclectic approach, right, to art and aesthetics, but wrote on a wide range of artistic phenomena in social life. Um, why isn't that expressed more readily in the theoretical frameworks that have grown up? So, you know, right there with you, Mugue, and thinking with Lisa and Laura, Dominic and Alex about um, reintroducing meaning, like really doing meaning, we have the um, ingredients the kind of like raw materials to do that that have been set aside, but still present themselves as I think um, richly productive. Thank you. Just to add to what you're saying, actually, you know, I would recommend uh, Jose Itzikson and Carita Brown's uh, book on uh, the voice and double consciousness, because I do use in this new theoretical framework uh, um, um, double consciousness because it's able to bring the marginalized technically, you know, uh, blacks together with the, the oppressors, the whites. And, and that is what is interesting about it. It doesn't privilege either top down or bottom up. It looks at the able to look at them together. And that's something we can't do with our straight sort of monocausal uh, explanation. And I'll just stop there, sorry. I think that's a fantastic note on which to close the discussion. Um, just before I, I say goodbye, I wanted to mention that this is the last event that's being organized by the current convening team of the BSA Theory Group. So Barry, Christian, and I are stepping down, and it is being uh, taken over by a fantastic trio, Joe, Joanna, and uh, Sebastian. So they have uh, several uh, events planned uh, for the coming year. So please stay tuned. They will be getting in touch about that. One of them involves uh, the postgraduate forum. So uh, there's lots in store there. Laura, could you tell us what's in, what's in store for the Sociology of Art group next year? Absolutely. So conversely, this is the first event um, that I am helping to organize as the co-convener of the BSA Sociology of Art Study Group along with Lindsay Zhang at the Courtauld Institute. Um, this is the first event. There will be more that are in the pipeline, but it's early days just yet. Um, but just a flag, please do join our mailing list. It's just mail BSA Sociology of Art, um, because what we're really trying to do is use the network as a generative space for more conversations like this. So it's great to have had this one today to kick it off. Wonderful. So with that, um, I want to um, ask you to join me in thanking our fantastic speakers and encourage you to take a look at their chapters and the rest of the volume. We're, we're so proud of uh, how it's come together and the sort of questions that it's asking. So I've put um, in the chat a discount code that Paul Grave um, put together for attendees of this session in case you wanted to, to get your own copy or, or arrange one for your library, but another will be emailed to you. So thank you again for joining us today and thank you to all of the brilliant speakers for talking about their work. I think you've given us so much to think about. So thank you.